Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. You listen to the coaches panel. Dane Zorko here from the Brisbane Lions. Jason Johannesson from the Western Bulldogs. Luke Parker here from the Sydney Swans. It's Roy Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows, and you're listening to the coaches panel. Maxwell and Melbourne Football Club. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club, and you're listening to the coaches panel. Hey friends, you got MJ from the Coaches Panel. Welcome back to another episode of the 50 Most Relevant, where I work our way through who I think are the most relevant players in the 2022 fantasy footy season. Number eight today, Stephen Cornelio, one of the GWS co-captains. Some look at the name and think there's not a chance in the world they're going to pick him this year. Others are going, wow. He's one of the easiest selections, and maybe that's what makes him so interesting to discuss this preseason. We had him on yesterday. We had to get him back. I've got Kane again. Hello, mate. How are you? Very well, MJ. Yes, another interesting player, another giant for me. But I appreciate that. I do like my giants. You do? And this is a guy as well that I think a little bit like Bruce yesterday, there's not, I don't want to say misinformation, but there's a bit of, as you mentioned off the top, no way or absolutely doesn't matter what he does, he's in. Like, it seems like he's quite polarised. It's very absolute, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's very much one side or the other. It doesn't seem to be much middle ground or I want to have a look. So that always that always piques my interest when I hear people so one-sided on a player. Yeah, and the reason they're one-sided, and we'll talk about his year in a moment as we work through some of his stats, is you look at what he did in 2021, and that's what's caused the no way. Still just the 28 years of age, he did pick up a dual position status for us, so he is mid-forward eligible, and his best scores last year was a 92 across the formats. Though, both of those scores are monstrously away from career-high scores. Back in 2019 against the Gold Coast Suns, he pumped out a 192 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, and he's a part of the 200 club in Supercoach with a 207. Last year, averages of 59 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, 60 in Supercoach. That's where we've got coaches concerned. Couldn't crack much over 60 and couldn't crack a score much over 90 last year. In Supercoach, oh, how can you say no at this price? As a mid forward, 261, 300. Just under 700,000 in AF. Not to, I don't hate the format, but I hate that um, way they go about awarding the discount to the lowest, of, of the highest of the two seasons. I'm not a fan. I get it, but I'm not a fan of it. Um, and 402,500 in DT. And we'll talk about that 2020 season year in, in a moment, Kane. We'll talk about 2021. But whenever a guy has a little bit of stank on him, which the past two years, it's safe to say, has not gone the way he'd wanted, we just discount a player's ability so much. So we know injury played a part of last year. We know he was one of many players that struggled through the bubble of 2020. But when Cornelio's fit and firing, even just two or three short years ago, he was one of the best premium midfielders in fantasy footy across the formats. Yeah, and you talk about a well-rounded game, MJ. That's what we loved about Stephen, didn't mm. we? Like, the way he could win. He's never been a massive ball winner. Like, in terms of, you know, his best seasons are up around the 28. Yeah. You know, when he had that season in 2019 where we all got to remember that while he averaged at what it says, 104, we know that there was, in fact, a zero. And at that point, he was up around 111. So, yeah. when you've got a guy that's basically 28 touches four marks, four tackles, or five marks, five tackles, and a goal. Like, it's really well-rounded. He's always been a guy that kicks more than he handballs. So he's just got this beautiful game for a fantasy point of view. He doesn't get tagged. Um, and he's got a great work rate. He's got that yeah. work rate inside, outside. Um, he's just almost how you'd build a fantasy scorer. And now, super coach, it doesn't translate as much. He's not maybe as impactful as some other midfielders. Sure. But if we just focus on DT for a while, that's the exact guy you want. Balanced score build, gets yep. to 110, no attention, None. in a great team. Uh, it ticks so many boxes. And it's crazy when you think about, you know, what, as you mentioned, sort of, I guess, the stank around Stephen is, he's just a guy that we loved. And all of a sudden, everyone's fallen out of favor with him. And I think there is a few, a few reasons. I think the doco didn't portray him in the way that I think 
people inside the club and people that know him well. Yeah, this is the making their mark doco that was yeah, on Amazon Prime. He definitely yeah. had an impact. You know, unfortunately for Stephen, he was going through a tough time, body wise, you know, team wise. There was there's always pressure about Leon Cameron, despite him seemingly making the finals every year and winning a final most years. Mm. There's pressure. You know, there's a lot of pressure on the Giants. They're viewed as that silver spoon type of team, aren't they, in the competition? Yeah. They don't get any friendly treatment from anyone, especially nope. at other clubs. You know, everyone thinks, you know, they've been given this absolute gift of a premiership side and they can't get it done. So people saw that and I think they thought, you know, this is a guy that you know, doesn't seem to have it going on anymore. It seems like there's all this noise and obviously it ended with him getting dropped for a week. And you start thinking, oh my God, this guy is a captain. He's not even in his own side. Yeah. But you look at it a bit deeper and you look at, I guess, a bit, take a step back and look at the whole picture. From a numbers point of view, he's missed one game in 2020. And that was when he was dropped. Game. Yep. And yet, his average is 98 in super coach. Adjusted. 78, yeah, 98, 78 in D, yeah. yeah, 78 in DT adjusted to a really high 90s. And you go, okay, like, geez, if that's a down year, is high, high 90s? Yep. And he's got some body issues, he's got some form issues, we've got COVID going on, we've yep. got all these factors that I would think you would excuse a player for. Now, the thing that made it hard for Stephen was when you set the bar that, bar, the bar that high, yeah, which he has, and you just got this mega deal, and you're the captain for the mm-hmm. first time. Yes, any sort of dip looks terrible. Yes, correct. And people did jump on, and as I said, in a footy sense, the Giants for a lot of other teams and a lot of other footy fans, are hard to like. They think they've just been given this opportunity. Yep. And people don't like them. They're not going to get a fair go at it, are they, MJ, really? Especially a guy like Stephen Canelo. You're on this money. You're the captain. You're blah, blah, blah. So that was a hard year. And as I said, a hard year was a high 90s. We, We go to last year. Injury. That, okay. That's what it is. Yeah. Injury. He's got an injury. Multiple. He played a couple of games. There's a an 88 and an 85 in round one in Dream Team and also in Super Coach. Pumps out an 80 in round two in Super Coach and 92 in Dream Team and Fantasy against Melbourne. Goes down with an injury. Not seen for the better part of the next four months. Plays a game. Not seen again for the better part of a month. And then playing a weird hybrid half forward, deep forward pocket role trying to cover for the absence of a Toby Green. Uh, it, it was just a weird year for him. Well, MJ, I, I reeled these, these stats off when we spoke about Matt Rao. Yeah. And the point I want to make is it is so difficult when you get an injury. Yes. You miss an extended period of time, which in Stephen's case was four months That's between a long games. Time. Okay. This is what happened to a Josh Dunkley in his final five games of the home and away season. He averaged 63. You know, like that's Josh Dunkley, who mm. people before that was absolutely flying. He was the best Dunkley player in the game going at, at one, Yeah, He was going at 116 as a forward. A Dylan Shield, right? His final five games of the home and away season goes at a 62 after yeah. missing a very similar amount of time. So you have to throw out those type of seasons. Mm. You have to throw it out. You can't judge a guy who's doing everything he can to get back as quickly as he can to provide the Giants an option. And as you mentioned, there was Whitfield out of the team. There was Green out of the team. They're pushing for finals. So you just have to let that go. Like for me, 2021, I can't even, I can't even look at it. It's not worth looking at. We know the years prior, he's a high 90s basement right up to that ceiling level of a 110 guy across the formats. At his price point in Supercoach, where he's like 50,000 more than Horn Francis... If he's fit and named round one, I don't care where he plays on the ground. You pick him. It, it is as no-brainer as that for you in Supercoach. In Dream Team and Fantasy, it might not be for everybody, depending on your structure. But if you're looking for someone in and around that $400,000 price range, um, across any line, Cogs must be considered. In AFL Fantasy, yeah, he's not the value that I would have loved him to be. But still, where he's priced in the early 80s, he's still got 15 points per game of value within him. And if he isn't a great start, we'll talk about his role and his health in a moment. But even if he's not flying in AFL Fantasy with the two trades a week, use or lose, 
you set a benchmark of if you're not going 90 by the end of round two, I'm going to flip away and go grab a Heaney. I'm going to jump on the guy that pops like a Jaden Stevenson or a, a Taylor Walker did last year and get on the break even train for two weeks. That's what he designs for you is he gives you options and avenues to explore everywhere you go. The good news coming out of GWS at the moment, as much from the mouth of Leon Cameron, has been he's tearing the track up. I know those superlatives get thrown around every preseason, but it is in the best interest of GWS, Leon Cameron, and certainly Stephen, for him to have a great season this year. And I think everything that's come from track watchers is he's had a very full preseason. He's trained well. That aerobic capacity, that athletic ability that you talked about earlier, Kane, is back and on display. So I think we need to presume health because the year prior to the one just gone, it was a healthy season. So yes, there's a couple of injuries that are scattered across his career, but there's also a number of full or nearly full game years. So for me, I'm going to presume health. Everything in the preseason is strong. The question that I think we need to to look at before we wrap up the episode and look at where we do take him in drafts is, what is that role? Is He's at his best in the midfield, but is that what's best for the team, Kane? Well, that's where MJ 2021 does matter. Again, I said throughout the numbers, what you do have to look at is the makeup of this team. Yeah. And, and what has emerged in that side, you know, for example, Jacob Hopper made the All-Australian squad. Mm. Tom, Tom Green is on the rise. Yes. Josh Kelly played his best football back on the inside. You know, we know we've got Taranto in the team. We know Toby Green's going to miss the first five weeks through suspension. Yeah. We know Lockie Ash did a really good job yep. tagging some of the best opposition midfielders. Now, he's got a lot of versatility, doesn't he? He's got he that pace off half back. He can play on a wing. Now he's playing as an inside mid with defensive responsibilities. And I'm sure if needed, they could put him forward. So the thing with Stephen that does make it a little tricky and where you probably have to think back to those 110 seasons and say, what was he doing then? Well, he was an inside yeah. midfielder. He was a center bounce midfielder. If he's not going to get that opportunity, you have to peg back what his ceiling can be. Now, at the yeah. price you mentioned, and with Ford status, yes. 105, 110 isn't the bar anymore. No. The bar is probably for what you'd be feeling good for the season, and maybe it's not a massive win, but I think it's a win where mm. you keep him. It seems like it's a 90. If yeah. he's getting to 90... That's huge. If he's getting huge. to 90... And also, MJ, the thing that's always a positive with these situations is, you know, God forbid there's an injury to a Hopper, to a Green, to a Kelly... Who's the type of guy that you can put in there? Yep. You can put in a Cornelia. So if you've got the possibility of a guy who might pick up in the back half of the season that role and go on a run of 110s, which he can do, he can go much higher than that too if he you know, has his ceiling game. Like you mentioned, his ceiling is as good as it gets in yeah. the league. So for me, a 90 in the forward line, I know there is some big dogs. You know, there's some guys that probably can push 105 and even 110 on their day. But of what you're paying for, and maybe AF is the exception, as you said, where sure. when you're priced at 80, the scope for improvement's not great. He probably feels to me a look and see. Yep. But in the other formats, it's so cheap that like, if that's your F6, you feel pretty good, don't you? With the upside that you, you have get. to. You have to. Yeah, no. So it's just it's just curious to me that it seems like he's been a bit written off. You know, he's still at a good age. Yeah, he's still a co-captain now, and he's still a very good player. Again, I think back to the goals he kicks, MJ. You know, some of those goals he kicks going forward. He, he's a really, really very crafty. damaging forward. And, yeah. and the one thing I will say is, when you hear some of the chat out of the Giants, is even guys like Hopper, like these guys that were pure inside midfield are mm. saying, I need to start developing more forward craft. Correct. I need to start developing another position. Because we need the ability to roll guys through, depending on who we're playing, how we're playing. Yep. It's, just, it's not going to just be, it can't be almost in the modern game. There's not many guys that can just play pure mid. You know, even Clayton Oliver, you've seen him develop. 
Yeah, that's right. Game. Lockie Neal is is really crafty around goals now. You just got to keep adding to your game. So, yeah. I think while he might not get the sixty percent CBAs, if he can get up to thirty or forty MJ, it's still going to give him every chance to push towards that ninety. And like you said, in Super Coach and DT, that's not just enough. That is a massive win. Um, if you get at a touching cow price in Super Coach towards that, oh, amazing. You get anything towards the 90 rage in DT. He's done his job. Could turn into a premium that you hold for the year, but I wouldn't be banking on it, and you don't need to at that range. I, I agree. AF, two approaches. Wait and see, or jump on and set your indicators for the first few weeks and jump away quickly. It all depends how many of those guys you're looking as your options to flip and turn early. You can't have 10 of them because you'll just spin the wheels and treadmill it for the first month. You need to only have a couple that are the guys you're looking to move around. Where he goes on draft day for me is interesting. The forward stocks, if anyone's done any drafts so far this year or done any of the mock drafts at the Draft Doctors mock draft simulator, you know those top two or three tiers of forwards go quick and then it gets dirty real quick at the back end. Where do you think he goes on draft day? Is he is he an F2? Is it F3? Where, no, where yeah, does he go? To, he's he's got to be... He's got to be... Huh. He's an F3 if you're playing four teams in your league. Yeah. He, he's he's an F1. Let's let's be pretty clear with that. I think he's an F1. It's a late F1. Yep. I guess that. He's, he's probably right around... Yeah, that nice 10th, 11th forward. Um, again, it's single season, obviously. So yeah. I, I, when I look at that, I go... I can't see sub-80. I just can't see sub-80. Not if he's fit. I agree. There's already concerns about a Jake Stringer and his groin. You know, who knows what happens with the goey. It sounds like, you know, he's list being back with the group and, you know, well, sounds like he'll play, by, obviously, by all reports. But yeah, I still forward. think, yeah. you know, this is a guy that is, I've got his floor at 80. And again, as I've said, if, he, if it fell his way, I don't think 105 is out of the question. No, you know, I agree. Across the whole season, maybe, maybe not. But um, as you mentioned, with the with the forties going up against, you start getting anywhere in the eighties, you're really pushing an F one. So I think he's F one. Now, having said that, if there's ninety five, hundred mids on the board, I'm going to find it hard to take to, pick, to take them. Steven. Yeah, yeah. I still think I'm putting him with the ninety mids. You know, I'm, I'm taking him just before I'm taking a hopper. Yeah, in a single fair. season, like these these guys that you just think they're just solid ninety guys. Yeah. Well, I'm taking the forward, and, and again, will you get him at that point? Mm. Maybe, maybe not. I think there's always going to be a coach that says he's just going to bounce back to be a hundred midfielder. He's as a forward. I'll take him, you know, in round four yeah. or five. Yeah. You know, I think he's a bit later than that. Yeah. That's if you, I think if you've got him as an eighty forward and you judge him there. You'll get him at a place that you're happy with. I don't think you'll be reaching. If you get him much later than that, I think you've done pretty well for yourself. I, I think that's about right. If you, in a dream world, you land him at F2, the reality is him at an F1, it, it's almost comparable to, say, an Isaac Heaney, um, where you could go heavier on other lines and you know you'll get these guys a, around to two later than where you might have to for an F1. Um, they give you that scope to still feel like you've got a strong leader in that division and you can still stonk up in the other areas as well. So for me, I, I'm really quite happy with how that stacks out um, through there. Keepers, a, a different story, but definitely um, I see him right in that contention for a top 10 forward. Um, if all things being equal, he could turn into a hold and a premium for the year for us if we're lucky, but don't plan for it plan to move him out of your salary cap side um, that way you're not going to be disappointed in counting him as a premium in your starting squad when he's actually needs to be viewed as a stepping stone and nothing more hey mate appreciate your work on the episode no worries MJ thank you if you want to go and check out the article on Stephen Canelio it is online for you now at coachespanel.tv plenty of stuff to make sure you go and check out while you're there all the articles of every player revealed the podcast, you can go back wherever you're streaming or downloaded this episode from. You can go back and get all the others. There is hours and hours of preseason content to catch up on.
And tomorrow we make our way into the number seven of the 50 most relevant. I think he's one of a clear no-brainers in that line. I, I look at who's available. I look at what he's priced at. I look at his history. And I just go, pick. I don't see how people are discounting him as a legitimate gun in his line. He's a no-brainer. And we're getting to this stage of the 50 where a lot of these guys are no-brainer picks. Maybe he won't be upgraded. Maybe he won't be started for everybody. But in your finishing team, you want this boy in your side. Who is he? I'll tell you tomorrow in the 50 Most Relevant.